We are live. <laughs> I guess that means that we're there. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk today about test-driven development. And um, so to uh, motivate why we do test-driven development and what it is. So in the early days of software development, this is when I was, you know, early in my career, it was like this. Uh, we would do all of the testing manually. There was not really any automated testing at all. And so all the testing would be done by hand. And you would have a QA tester who would uh, bang on your application. And a uh, you know the developer would write the code. They'd uh, bundle it up, deploy it into an app. And then the uh, tester would launch it and click on all the buttons and try out all the things. And they had uh, test scripts that they would try and follow to what it is that make sure they are testing everything. And uh, if there was a bug, they would write up the bug, and uh, you know, and with screenshots of how they got there and steps on how to reproduce it. So if they came across a bug, they'd have to go back and make sure that they could reproduce it every single time, so the developer could look at, at could look it over and. So then they would take this uh, bug report, send it to the developer. The developer would read it through, put get everything set up, walk through, uh, recreate the bug, uh, fix it, and then uh, repackage the, rebundle the app, repackage it, send it back to the testing department. And the testing department would then run through their test again, and they would verify that it actually worked. Well, this was fine and good, but then they discovered that uh, many, many times when a developer fixes a bug in one place, they introduce another bug in a different place. And frequently they'll introduce a bug that had been fixed beforehand. <laughs> and so so they, that we say that that bug regressed. It used to be fixed and now suddenly it's back again. And very common. I never understood how bugs reappeared, but they would. So they called that regress, the bug would regress, come back again. And so this process then would be called, was called regression testing. They do their standard testing. And then after they'd done several of those, they'd go back and do all of the old uh, test steps all over again to make sure that no, no bugs had reappeared uh, anywhere in the process. And then, you know, this is, this is loop and loop and loop and loop and loop of trying to get these things fixed. Um, at a you know mid-sized company, it was not uncommon for the testing team to be maybe half the size of the development team. So you'd have just you know if it took uh, twenty developers, you'd have ten testers. So a lot of expense in trying to um, staff all of this. And the worst part was it took as long to get out of QA. Uh, you know this testing called QA. It took as long to get out of QA as it did to get into QA. So you'd, you'd develop for, oh, typical projects would take six months. So you develop for six months, think, okay, awesome, let's celebrate, we're done. We just handed it off to QA. It would be another six months before it came out of QA and was ready to be deployed. So it, it basically, uh, this manual, pro manual testing doubled the time that it took to, uh, to deploy your projects. So it was very expensive, very onerous, and very challenging to, to get done. Very, oh, you know, it, as a developer, it's a lot of fun those first six months writing all of the code and making things work and adding features and functionality. And those second six months were a complete nightmare. It's just bug report after bug report going through tediously one at a time trying to fix them all. And it was, it was really bad. So anyway, it was pretty awful. So um, in 1997, a guy named Kent Beck uh, was trying to figure out how to uh, deal with this, and he introduced uh, the uh, unit testing. And he did it first with a program called JUnit, where J stood for Java. So it was Java unit testing. And it was a unit testing framework, much like what we were using for Jest. Um, not nearly as nice, um, but it worked. And so it would do this unit testing. So again, you know, the concept for unit testing is that you um, um, uh, you take a function 
that wor uh, works in a certain way and uh, you pass it known inputs and you check to make sure it got the correct known output. So if it was, uh, I, I have like a uh, function that adds two numbers, a trivial example. So you'd pass it a four and a 12 and you'd make sure that it returns 16. Uh, when I first learned about this and heard about it, I thought, why would anyone want to do that? That makes no sense at all. I can just do console log of my and my output and I can just look in the logs and see it that it's working. Why would I want to have this unit test thing? Well, I didn't realize that this would run automated and that I would actually want to know after I'd made numerous changes to my code that that function still worked. And if I had to go back and do it by hand, it was really tedious and, and so on. So anyway, um, that's really what uh, what we came to. And then I love this quote um, that says, in unit testing, we assume that all code is uh, guilty until proven in innocent. And you prove it innocent by writing a test against it and proving that the test works. Okay. So anyway, uh, and I've said many times, and I'll repeat it again, because I've been through a lot of innovations in the software development industry. I was there when they introduced object-oriented programming, which was a huge change in paradigm for how to write code. Uh, I was there when they first started introducing runtime environments like the JavaScript runtime engine. Uh, the first one was Java. The Java runtime engine was the first one. Um, and then uh, scripting languages, and uh, and also when we switched from sh from shipping software on a disk or a floppy disk or a, a CD uh, to our customers, instead now we de um, deploy new versions over the air, and that's how we deliver our software. I've been through all of those transitions, but the one that made the biggest impact on how I think about and write code today is of all of those, the one that has had the biggest impact is unit testing. It has a huge, huge impact on how I do it. I love unit testing and I, I think that's one of the uh, best things that you can possibly learn to uh, enhance and improve your career. So strongly recommended that you spend some time learning and getting more proficient with unit testing. So anyway, unit testing over the years after it was introduced started becoming ubiquitous because it was such a huge innovation in uh, the way people write their code, like I said. And, um, and so Kent Beck continued to try and work out ways to improve the productivity of our programmers making better use of unit testing. And he came up with this idea that he introduced at a conference in 2001, which he called test-driven development. And um, so uh, that's what I'm gonna talk on here is what test-driven dr development is and how it makes your, uh, your work much more productive, why you want to do, be using it. And I'm going to go through an example. And I'll actually go through the same example that Kent Beck used when he did, when he first introduced uh, test-driven development in this conference. And uh, I'll show you. I'll, I'm only going to go through a few steps of it. Uh, he uh, uh, he, he of course went through the whole thing, and then I have a link in my in the in this uh, uh, document that gives you the link to a very well done uh, walkthrough of the entire one. It's not the same one Kent did, but it's a very uh, very good thorough uh, uh, example. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what is test driven development and how it differs from the normal process. So when unit testing first came out usually what we would do is we would write our code and usually you'd spend a week or two writing all your code and then you go, okay, now it's time to go in and test it and make sure it works. And so you'd go in and you'd start writing all your, your automated tests, your unit tests. And you'd run the unit tests against the code, find bugs and fix them and so on. Uh, over time, we realized that if you wait too long, the, your incentive to write the unit test declines and you don't want to do them. And so they don't get written or it's very tedious because you have a whole bunch of code, you know, a thousand lines of code you have to go and write tests against and it's hard, it's a lot of work. So we started then shrinking the time between well, when we wrote the code and when we wrote the tests. So test-driven development though actually kind of flips that on its head. And in test-driven development, it's called test-driven development because you write the test first. You write the test before you write any code. 
which sounds really strange, but I'll show you how it works and it's pretty cool. So you write a test, first of all, you say, okay, I'm gonna, I need a function that adds two numbers. So you don't sit down and declare your function and write your function. Instead, you sit down and you write a test that says, assuming this function existed, here's how I would call it and here's the result I would expect. And then, um, and then you run the test, it fails, and then you write the code that fixes it and makes the test pass. So I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Oh, I will note this bottom paragraph. I get, I've gone into a lot of teams and companies where they, I realize that there are just no unit tests. And they say, how do we get there? How do we start? It's going to be a, a nightmare to do this. And I said, okay, the best way to start is you adopt a policy that says you will not fix a bug unless you write a test that exposes the bug before you fix it. And so that's... Um, uh, and I just realized this is an old version of my presentation. No wonder it's not seeing what I wanted to see. There we go. Okay. So um, anyway, so when you do it on, I, when you adopt that policy, then you start building up the number of unit tests in your system and you get more and more tests. And also I've discovered I can't count before I started adopting this policy. I, I don't think I can count the number of times I have been given a bug report, fixed it, pushed the code out to production, only to discover that the bug was still there. And I remember one case at Google where I fixed a bug five different times and pushed it to production, and it still was there. <laughs> and so I didn't really understand the bug. So if I write a test first that fails because there's a bug there, then, it, then I am certain that... Um, I have, I'm not certain, but I'm much more confident that I have properly understood the bug and that I now know why it's failing. And so when I fix it and the unit test passes, then uh, I'm much more likely to, uh, to not have this terrible, frustrating experience of having my fix not really fix the problem. All right, so here's the test-driven process. Test-driven process follows three steps. And we call them red, green, and refactor. So you're always going, th and then you cycle. You just cycle over and over and over again. Red, green, refactor. So it's like a stoplight. Red, green, refactor. Red means the test doesn't pass. Green means the test passes. And refactor is when I clean up the code. So here you go. In, a red, in the red phase, you write the test against the new behavior you're trying to implement. And you make sure that your test runs and fails. The reason you do that is because you want, well, I'll get into more detail, I guess, later, but you do, so let me not get into that. So you write the test that fails, that's the red phase. I now have a failing test, the test is red. So then I go in and I write the production code that fixes the test, and so the test turns green. So most of the test unit testing tools actually will display red for a failing test and green for a passing test. So you start out writing a test that fails, then you write the production code that fixes it, and then after that's done, then you go and you do the refactoring and clean up the code, and you run the test continually, keeping the test green. And then once you're done with that, then you cycle. Go, okay, now I've done that, what's the next step? And you write a failing test, and then you write the production code and you, and you refactor, and you go through this cycle. So in a little more detail, in the red phase, the red phase is really what differentiates test-driven development from uh, normal, the you know the normal process, and because in the red phase, you it comes first, and you're writing the test before you write the production code. So in this phase, you write the test against the behavior that you're going to implement, and the test must fail. If it doesn't fail, then you haven't properly written your test. Um, I've written a lot of tests where they passed only to discover that they weren't really testing the code I thought they were, or that for some reason they weren't even running and I was fooled because all the other tests passed or things like that. So the goal here is to write a test that must fail because the feature's not yet implemented. So you do that. Um, and then um, you write just enough of the test to make sure that you're what it is you're going to do next fails. You don't write tests for the entire program. You don't write tests for everything. You just write it for this next step. This part fails and you and on the next step of it. 
then um, you know while you're writing your test, you can look over the interface, make sure it's like wh what you want it to be, and that it behaves properly, and so on. And uh, and there you go. So now I've got my test that fails, and now I say, okay, now I move to the green phase. Now in the green phase, you fix the test, but it's very important that you write. In, at least in the TDD process, it's very important that you only write enough code to make the test pass. You don't write any other code, just enough to pass the test. The simplest code you can think of that will make the test pass. I'll, and we'll go through that and you'll see it. So you might you know, do that, you're writing the code, you're, write, you're fixing the, the test, you're getting it to pass, you look at it and think, oh my goodness, uh, this code's now a mess, I need to fix it. Well, you can't do that yet. You have to wait until you exit the green phase. Uh, you know, if you if you're if the test hasn't passed yet, you're still in the green phase, and you're not allowed to clean up your code. So you just write it until the test passes. Now that's passing, I can enter the refactor phase. So in the refactor phase, this is where you clean up your code. You improve the code quality. You do things easier. Maybe you find you have to change your interface or do other things that you do. So this is where you clean up and get your code doing as you do it. You're running your tests every single time you, you save over and over and over again to make sure that your refactoring isn't introducing new bugs. And then and so you do that during the refactoring phase. And so then at the end of the refactor phase, your code should be clean and it should look professional, you know, professional quality. So the, the goal is at the end of each refactor phase, you have good high quality code. So another way I found these rules that I thought were interesting for test-driven development, and it's a good way to uh, summarize what TDD is all about. So there's four phase, four rules here. Number one, you are not allowed to write any production code at all in any of your .js files unless, there, unless you're doing it to fix a failing test. So if you don't have a test that fails, you are not allowed to write code. The first thing you're doing instead is writing the, the, the test. Now, when you write a unit test, you're not allowed to write anything more in your unit test than what is necessary to test the new behavior you are about to implement. You're not allowed to go and say, well, gee, I'm gonna need this, 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 and this, and then write tests against those. You write one test that fails against the one feature that you're trying to, or behavior that you're trying to add. Okay, and just enough that it causes it to fail. The rule number three, when you're writing your production code, you're not allowed to do anything more than just fix the test. You write the simplest thing you can think of to fix the test and to fix that one failing test. And then the fourth rule is that you may only clean up code in the refactoring phase when all the tests are passing. You may not refactor your code if there are any failing tests. So those are the, those are the rules. And then of course you run your tests frequently to make sure that everything's still going well. All right, so here we're gonna do an example. This is the example that Kent Beck did in his, in his TDD thing. So uh, we're going to convert a, ro a decimal number to Roman, number, uh, Roman numerals, okay? And so here's the, here's the mapping of the symbols. I is one, B is five, X is 10, and so on, all right? So those are the rules right there. And so we're gonna just do this uh, to do it. And um, here's the link to the, uh, Roman numeral thing, uh, the guy, this guy named Ray Cinema. It's written in Java, but you should be able to understand it just fine. So um, instead of showing the walking through the steps on the screen, I'm going to actually do it live. So here we go. I'm going to switch. Here you go. I got us a little bit started, and I'm again. I'm using the J unit, or sorry, the um, the Jest plugin, so that as I make changes over here and save my tests uh, on the right hand side, will update, uh, and it'll do it live. So here we go. Um, I'm going to convert a Roman numeral to a decimal to a Roman numeral. So I'm going to start out with the easiest case I can think of, and that's the number one. What is the number one supposed to be in Roman numerals? I, so I wrote a test. I test, I say one should be I, right? And so here's my test. I expect the two Roman function passing at one to give me back I. Clear enough? Obvious. Okay, so let's fix it. How do I, what's the easiest thing I can do to fix this? Yell it out, come on. 
uh, even simpler than that. Okay, that will make my test pass, right? Okay, save. Test passes. Awesome. I'm done. I'm done with that step. All right, let's go on. Now we're we're uh, we're we did the red phase, the green phase. Now the refactor. Uh oh, did we lose the recording? We are back. Okay, did I lose you? Still recording. I dipped out for a second. It seems like we're back. Okay. All right, here we go, though. Here we go. This is the simplest code that will fix that test. Agreed? Okay, save. Test passes, we're, at, we're, we're in the green phase, we're done with the green phase. Now uh, let's do the refactor phase. Any way I can refactor this code to clean it up? Not that I can see, it looks pretty simple. All right, what's the next test? Three should be I, I, I. Okay, this is looking kind of boring, right? Save. It fails. I have now successfully completed the red phase. So I'm going to go to the green phase. What's the easiest way I can fix this test? Save. Test pass. Let's go to the refactor phase. Any refactoring I can do? I could do a switch statement. That's not much different. So I don't know. I'm not really seeing much. So let's go to the next one. What's next? You know what I bet? I, let me let me take that back. Before I save this, undo. I bet I could bet I could just do a loop. This should work, shouldn't it? And that's a little cleaner than what it was before. Instead of all those if statements, it actually has some logic in it. So let's do that. Let's save. Oh, good. The test still passed. All right, good. So that refactoring was all right. All right, let's do the next test, the next phase. Four is next. What should four be? IV. Though I've seen clocks that say I, 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 which is kind of strange. And four should be, all right, we ready to save? I wrote my failing test, good. I made it out of the red phase, I've got my failing test. All right, so now I'm going into the green phase. What's the easiest thing I can do here? You agree that's the easiest thing I can think of to fix it? Inside the for loop? I don't know. That sounds harder to me if I put any check inside the for loop. Because then I'm not going to, I'm going to get some weird I, I, I stuff on, on it. So, right. Yes, Justin. Oh, okay. So this seems simple. Save. It fixed it. Okay. Um, so we're out of the green phase. Um, let's go to the refactor phase. Any refactoring we can see that uh, is pretty clear here? We're starting to see some patterns evolve, but it's a little unclear. I'm not really sure. I think I need to do another step before I can be certain that there's some cleanup that can happen. So let's go back to the red phase. In the red phase, we write our next test. 
I'm in the red phase. And what should 5 be? So I expect 5 to be V. Save. Good. My test fails and the test looks right. So I am exited the red phase. I'm now in the green phase. What's the easiest thing to do here? If decimal equals five, return V. All right. We agree this will fix it. Okay. All my tests pass. Great. Now can we refactor? Anybody see anything that can uh, clean this up? I'm not really seeing it. There's some possibilities there, but I'm not certain yet. Let me take a peek because it's kind of hard to think here on the stage. And when I did five, I wrote this code and I agreed. All right, there wasn't really any obvious refactoring when I went through it by hand, by myself when I had more time. So uh, let's do the next test, six. What's six supposed to be? VI, so I want six to be VI. I'm in the red phase where I'm trying to write a failing test. If I save and it turns red, then I've successfully exited the uh, red phase. And sure enough, it turns red. So good. What's the easiest way to fix this? Yeah, that's the easiest way. Boy, you know, I could probably clean this up. Maybe put some looping in here instead of doing this. Oh, wait, I'm not allowed to. I'm in the green phase. I write the easiest code imaginable to get the test to pass. So I guess I have to do that. All right, save, green. Okay, now I can start thinking about, is there some cleanup I can do? Okay, so let's see. Who can think of something I can do to fix this up? I bet if I subtracted five and put in a V, something like that. And so I subtract five, put in a V, and then take the what's left and put that at the end. Of course, if it's a four, that's not going to work. But I could put the if four up at the top. Let's see. Still passes. Good. Um, let me take, let me get rid of these two guys right here and just put, do something like let remainder equal decimal. And then what do I do? Uh, subtract five. If remainder is greater than or equal to five, then I want to subtract. And add a V, right? Something like that. What does this do for us? Ooh, didn't like those ones. I thought I would have gotten, I thought I would have gotten a V there. Oh, who sees the bug? I got V I I I I I. Very good. Let's fix that and see what we did. Whoa. That worked. I didn't actually didn't think it was going to fix both of them. So that fixes all of them, okay? And so on. So we can continue on. I didn't actually do any others than this in my write-up because it was so tedious to write in Markdown. Uh, and this is... Oh, look. There is more I can do. Okay, let's... Um, come on. Get these fingers going properly. All right, let's try seven, see what happens. Uh, seven's going to be, I think seven should just work. I, I'm guessing that seven will work. Save. Uh, I don't have a red 
test yet, so I I can't claim I'm going into. I'm betting this one works too, so I'm still in the red phase trying to figure out how to write it. Oh, that one doesn't work because I didn't change that. Okay, there it does work. So nine, I'm betting nine has a problem. Okay, ix. Save. This one won't work. We're pretty sure of that. Okay, so now what am I going to do? So again, the easiest thing to fix it. Okay, so that fixes that. Now refactor time. Okay, and so we're going to look and see is there a way to refactor this and so on. So I'm not going to continue on beyond this. Um, I could... We could do it together. Maybe that'd be fun. But uh, is there a refactoring I can do? I'm not sure. Let me do 10. I guess I will continue. And here we're getting into uncharted territory for me. So I will probably embarrass myself. But, uh, and again, following the same strategy... Test pass. Now I'm thinking that there's some refactoring we can do. Like if we do this remainder thing, then um, yep, something like that. And maybe if I move this down in here, let's see. And then, yes, and then I still want to do this. And then if I want, let's see, maybe if I put this down here. Let's see if this works. I broke nine. Oh, I broke four. I don't understand why I broke four. Oh, I know why. I forgot to subtract four. Right? Okay, good. Four works. I broke nine. How do I fix nine? Yep, I put it up here. Oh, it still didn't work. Oh, it did work. Okay, just took it a while to show. So anyway, and we and we can continue on from here and I won't I won't go on further than that. Yes. Um I could I could leave it up there where I had it. But the advantage of this is that I'm guessing that this will work when I start getting into bigger numbers, like when I do 54. That it should it should do 54 correctly, like 14. I'm guessing that this will work for 14. So let's let we're in the red phase now. What should this be? XIV. Ah, uh, see it worked. So that refactoring I did earlier actually fixed a future problem. And it's um, in a way it was unfair, but on the other hand, I saw this pattern emerging that I could take advantage of and refactor and, and use it. Now it's not gonna work, it should work for 24. Anyway, so you can start figuring out where the, the different breakpoints are where it's not gonna work anymore. Write your test for that. So you see, I don't really have to test 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, because I know they work. I just have to write the ones where I know there's going to be a failure. Yeah. You're right. It doesn't loop. Yep. So there'd have to be a while up here that does this. So 
Wow. Let, okay, let's... Whoa! I just violated one of the rules. Shame on me. Okay. Let's test it for 24. This is going above and beyond what I had in mind. But that's cool. 24 should be XXIV. Okay, make sure I don't break a rule. And then we think that the way to fix this... Now, I have to do the easiest. Okay, the test green, so I know I know that my test is proper. I know my test is good. So if I, I wanted to do what? While remainder is greater than zero? Is that what you were suggesting? You're right, because then we'll do XX. Yep, you're right. Yep, 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 yep. So just change this. And then maybe I have to do it for all of the other ones too. But again, that I don't have my formatter set up here. So that fixed the test. Test still passes. Okay, and so I could now say, hmm, you know, I can do more refactoring like this one, can you do XVV? No, XVV is not legal. Okay, it's only for 10 and so on. So anyway, so we could go on and on and we'd probably the next time we'd run into problems was when we hit uh, 50 or actually 40. 40 would give us trouble because that's XL. And so uh, and so we could, you can see how we can then use this to go through there. Okay, so that is a very simple, demonstration of test-driven development, get comfortable with unit tests, and then I don't do this, I don't personally follow the strict TDD process, but I come close. You know, I uh, I cheat here and there because I, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I often will refactor when I, before I'm supposed to, and I often will uh, not write the test right before I run, write my code, but I, I get them the tests and the code going right at the same time, so they're running in parallel. And so all of the new code I write has a unit test that's sitting here and uh, turning green as I'm as I'm working on my code. So, um, but I suggest that when you're first trying to get into how do I use unit testing, how do I improve my processes, how do I become better at this that you go through this, uh, they call it a kata, that uh, demonstrates how to do it. Sit down and do it yourself, kind of what I did here, and just go through it and to get into the habit of this is how it's supposed to go and get familiar with it. And then that should help you get using unit tests more often. And I promise you that if you use unit tests uh, religiously, and just make very good use of them that your code will become better and better and better and your output will become better and better and better. You'll get done faster. Who knows the most common excuse, I've heard so many people tell me their code isn't tested because, why? That's true, but it's not an excuse. They didn't write unit tests for their product that is out there in production full of bugs. And their excuse for why they didn't write unit tests is because deadline, they didn't have time. I didn't have time to write unit tests, so I didn't. You know what my answer to that is? What? Malarkey? Close. My answer to that is, I don't have time to not write unit tests. It seems counterintuitive, but if you write unit tests, it, you know, you're right, it, it's off, it's very common. Look how much more code there is on our unit test than in our production code. It's very common for there to be more code in your unit test than there is in your production code. Happens all the time. Very, very common, especially if you have complex setup stuff that you have to do. And it's, it can be tedious. Um, but 
Why do I claim that things go faster if I write unit tests? Yes. Exactly right. If I'm not writing unit tests, my bug, is, my code is buggy, guaranteed, and um, and so I'm having to find those by hand. How do I find bugs by hand usually? Console logging is that tedious or what? You hate it. Yeah, I hate it. But it's how you solve, especially in this class. It's how it's the only way we have to solve bugs. I don't do console logging much anymore uh, when I'm working on my own code. Instead, I use unit tests, and they find the and they find the the bugs for me. I'll see a bug, uh, you know, somebody will report a bug. I'll look through, try to figure out what it is. I'll write a unit test, and then, oh, good, I discovered what it is. Now I can go in and fix it. And I almost never do console logging to figure out what's happening. Sometimes I do. I mean, it's not like it never you never use it. I use it sometimes, but but not very much. So there's that. I get my code written faster with unit tests because I write less of it. I write it correctly the first time, and I don't have to worry about it. And then the another reason is similar to what Bishan said. So not just during the development phase am I going faster, but during the production phase, I'm spending far, far less time fixing bugs because there aren't any. <laughs> there are always bugs, but there are not nearly as many bugs when you're when you're unit tested than when there aren't. And so I and so I get into production quicker because the testing cycle, the testing phase is a lot shorter. Instead of this testing phase that is the same amount of time as the development phase, it's now really really short because it's all well tested during development. Yes. If there seems to always be some bugs. Does it kind of just come down to how big are the bugs? And like, if they're not a huge deal, we just like let, let the app release or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember the phrase we used to use for that. It's uh, we our testing cycle lasts until we're exhausted and we can't and we just give up. <laughs> so you just kind of get to some point where you're, the number of bugs that's out there is small enough that they're not going to have a serious impact on your users. Usually you'll go through all your bugs and you'll categorize them. Uh, catastrophic, the, the app crashes, the user can't make any progress. Uh, causes a feature failure would be number two. Causes a feature failure, the user can't uh, complete a, a, fe a, crit a critical feature. Uh, number three is would be something like uh, it makes uh, the completion of the, of the task harder, but it's still doable. And number four is cosmetics, things like that. So you categorize your bugs and you say, we will not go to production as long as there are any category one bugs. Uh, and then the number of category two bugs needs to be, you know, a, a, a tiny amount. And then the three, four, five bugs, you, you kind of say, okay, we just fix as many of those as we feel like we have time for. And then once you get into production, you those will pile up even more. And then you start categorizing and figuring out what to fix. But yeah, you test and you fix you fix bugs only to the point where you just can't you, you can't afford to where it's more expensive to keep the product from shipping than it is to ship it and fix the bugs afterwards. So anyway, so uh, any other questions on uh, test driven development or testing in general? Once you get out there and get out of this class and you start doing your unit testing, remember. Do you have enough time? You're you're not writing unit tests because you don't have enough time. Your answer is, I I don't have enough time to not write unit tests. All right, that should be one of your favorite phrases. I don't have enough time to not write unit tests, and I promise you, your production, your output will increase. The quality of your code will increase. Your reputation will increase, and you'll have a wonderful career. So, all right. Cool. Anything else on uh, uh, remote land? I think we've absorbed all we can, Robert. <laughs> all right. Cool. All right. Take care. And we're done. Awesome. Thank you.